So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Rogers, and I'm the, the uh, Brunel's uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor for Enterprise and Employment. I'm delighted to welcome you here for the first inaugural lecture of 2024, and particularly so as we've had a little bit of a pause in the inaugural lectures, which I think was introduced by COVID, and then we never quite got back into the stride. So this is a this is a new and exciting experience for us all. So that's great, and it's great. It feels great to be back. I mean, these lectures have always been quite special. I'm really delighted to see so many members of the local community here tonight, which is really super. They're really intended to celebrate and showcase some of the really interesting research that we do here at the university across a range of disciplines, and also to talk about the impact that our research has on our diverse communities, on technologies, and on people, and that's something we're particularly proud of at Brunel. But it's great to be able to share some of our best research with our staff, our students, and, and members of the local community. I was saying to Tatiana, I've known Tatiana a very, very long time, so I'm particularly pleased to be introducing her today, uh, but who would have thought that AI could ever have got sexy? Uh, <laughs> and, and indeed, it does seem to have done so. So this, this year's series is a little bit different in that, please have a look at the, the program. We've tried to encourage the staff to, to say a little bit about their careers, their career journeys, and, say, and, and have some personal reflections on how they got where they are now, what has driven them, and how it's, how it's gone. So we hope to have a slightly more reflective feel to the talks, as well as also introducing some people to some of the ideas that they've been working on while they've been here at Brunel. So I say, tonight's lecture is given by Tatiana Karganova. I've always had a long had admired her work. Uh, and she has worked for the, she's going to say something about her career journey in a few minutes, but she's worked for the university uh, since, since the year two, 2000, having previously been a PhD student at Napier University in Scotland and before that in Be Belarus. Uh, she the reason I know her quite well is that she did some work with Caterpillar over the last 10 years, which probably was one of the, one of the most significant impacts that this university has had for a single piece of research on society. And in fact, we, her work with Caterpillar, Caterpillar wrote us a letter and said that uh, in one particular financial year, the work that Tatiana had done for Caterpillar had saved them about 800 million pounds and shifted their share price by a small percentage. The Caterpillar are an absolutely massive conglomerate. And uh, a pity we did not have a percentage of it, but we did not, so it was all a bit disappointing. But, and, and I think Tatiana has also, you know, been a, a great citizen for the university, and has also worked really hard to try and engage her students in her research, which has allowed a lot of students over many years to engage in really interesting knowledge exchange projects, which has been great. So the lecture will run for about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, which my colleague, Professor Khan, has agreed to mediate. And then you'll be invited to join us for reset refreshments in the atrium. And so it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Tatiana Kalganova to deliver her lecture entitled AI and its Real Life Applications. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Very good. So how are you doing? Artificial intelligence, does it say anything to you? Oh, so it's very much exciting. AI everywhere, like in any televisions and anywhere, home comes and so on, yeah? This is something that I was fascinated for the last couple of uh, decades, okay? Uh, where can we see artificial intelligence? How many of you have phones? I have phones. Do you have phones? Do you know that we are using a lot of artificial intelligence inside of our phones? You might not even recognize this. How much do we like our fingerprint recognitions, face recognitions, instead of uh, memorizing our passwords and anything? It's great, isn't it? So let's get a little bit quiz, because we should not be taking started with very like, technical stuff, which could get boring anywhere. AI. 
Have a look at the question. And the question says, when do you think you used artificial intelligence the first time? Now, we are going to use a little bit of uh, old technologies. Whenever you think it's your hours, you just can hands up, okay? You got the question? You got the answer? Let's have a look. Is it 70s? Anyone? No, not really, yeah? So, well, maybe. 80s. Anyone? We get two people, three, four, four people, five. Anyone more? Six. Six people in 80s. Very good. 90s. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a little bit more. Yeah, so coming in. Zeros, two thousands, nulls. One, two. <laughs> well, we're going down. I thought we'll go up. We're going down, actually, <laughs> coming around. Tens. Oh, and 20th? And now who has never used artificial intelligence? It doesn't get anymore in our audience because we do use it in our life. Now, a little bit of revelation. Has anyone heard about this? <laughs> you did? Do you know which year it was funded? In 1998, how long you may be using Googling? From 90s. So basically, what was happening with Google, they put the search engine in, everyone absolutely loved to use it, but no one know that this is artificial intelligence. In all journal uh, interviews and anyway, I will say, no, we are not using artificial intelligence. It's mathematical models. But at the same time, if we'll have a look who we were recruiting, we were recruiting specialists in genetic algorithms, machine learning, and so on. All of them is artificial intelligence. So which year you started to use uh, artificial intelligence first? Ah, off we go. So we start to get revelations. So what is artificial intelligence and when we started to use it, which some of us even haven't realized we did. Why artificial intelligence so popular? Why it started to build up a lot? Because a lot of models, when they come, they are like snowflakes, but it's never the same solution. How many of you tried to use chat GPT? Have you always get the same answers? No. And this is what artificial intelligence does. When it creates the answers, it's now the same. It brings creativity insight and works on this. And this is like some scientists in slow, snowflakes. They say you will never have two identical ones. And in AI, very often you will have different answers, whichever it comes. Well, uh, get a little bit more. Uh, can you see like sort of uh, pictures can you see how old this phone is, old phone? Yeah? How many of you Google, uh, used Google Maps? Has anyone used Google Maps? Well, one third of audience? I don't believe you. <laughs> In 2007, we were developing similar systems with our students for the tracking and looking on the maps. Using the cell phones of this generation, can you really see it? <coughs> We were on the edge of doing this here at Brunel. And developing to see if it's possible to use GPS trackers, to use them and put on the maps and tracing, something that everyone absolutely loves nowadays to use it. We were doing this some time ago. Uh, robots, can you see uh, this model of uh, phone? 2010, 12 years ago, yes. This is when uh, Apple haven't got yet great idea to have cameras on the back, yeah? So we were basically developing some sort of robots which would help elderly people inside of the houses to navigate and find out if something goes wrong. Dial up the Skype 
and see if anything wrong. This has been done using Lego, Lego robot, simple phone, and a Skype. So, and it was not yesterday, it was 12 years ago. So we have AI some time ago. It just, we were very afraid of using it, and we didn't know we were using it. So what is AI? Fancy word. Everyone's saying and trying to use everywhere in all different contexts. Uh, I never thought I needed to go through all the readings and say, oh, you're not using the word AI correctly, which nowadays it does happen very often. AI starts from uh, algorithms where we start to get some nature inspired. We are getting inspired by how we live and how we get. Does anyone know what man is this? Darwin, good. Charles Darwin, evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. What it says, we came from monkey. I'm afraid, from chimpanzee and anywhere else, this is what evolutionary theory of Darwin says. And in order to get from monkey, what we'll do? We will select the best. Some of us will have some mutate genes because of environments and anything, yeah? So we will have a breedings coming up, children will look like us and so on, and eventually we'll be getting better. What scientists did, they got inspired by theory of Darwin, and as a result started to develop algorithms called genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms. They are part of artificial intelligence nowadays. So artificial uh, genetic algorithms were in a long, long time. So in 50s, it was the first introduction of this algorithm. 50s, 1950s. 70 plus years ago? How does it sound? And some of you thought artificial intelligence started to be done only the last couple of years. No. Okay, genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms. What can we do with them? Um, we do quite a bit of stuff. At some point, um, <clears throat> I was thinking, I'm very lazy. I don't want to study theory how to forget about our electronic engineering colleagues. I don't want to know how to design the circuits. I don't want to know how to optimize it. I don't want to know how to put this on the board. I want algorithm of doing this. And we were trying to use evolutionary algorithms to do all this in one go, using genetic algorithm. We were creating the circuits, very optimal, the ones who never, nobody has used before. We had in our area, which is called available hardware, a professor called John Koza from uh, US. He was filing patents couple of patents a month. How do you think he did it? He was having algorithms up and running, a lot of computational power, and every single time we will be finding a new algorithm, a new circuit, he will file the patent. So, and this was happening in 90s. So in 90s, already were people were using AI to create some knowledge, some IP, and patent it. In our case, I'm afraid I have no idea how to get money for computational power. This is how I was running my algorithms. True. We were basically hijacking all our computer labs closing them down for Christmas, weekends, and anything else. And we were just up and running our algorithm just to get something out. This is how it was. But algorithms were creating something that we would never say that it was AI created by the power of evolutionary algorithms, but it was tangible to show how good results we were. Well, just for you to understand what can we do with all these Darwin theories in anywhere. Uh, I had some students once, and uh, he was coming out, well, I want to do something interesting with my um, 
final year project. So basically, okay, fine, let's do evolutionary algorithms. Yes, yeah, let's use genetic algorithms. He said, oh, I would like to have a look about forecasting of Bayesian exchanges no one has done before. Say, fine, do it. He did it. We used the real data to submit. The end of dissertation presentations, and I said, would you put your money on this system to get the money back? Normally, at this point, all PhD students and final year students will say, I develop a brilliant algorithm, but I'll not put my money on. Yeah? He did. He put. He put 100 pounds based on his algorithm. He got return 183 in one day. And this was done about more than 10 years ago. Um, I know one thing for fact, he has never ever asked me for extra money after this. <laughs> oh well, uh, electronic circuits and everything, it's very boring stuff. We absolutely love using our phones, but we don't want to know what it's contained of. How many of you like art? It's fair enough, okay? Let's have a look, four pictures. Yes, there is one picture here, which was generated, or maybe not generated, so there is one picture or not one picture, that has been generated by artificial intelligence in, just listen here, 2002. You got it? Let's check. Who thinks that this is the picture top right? Hands up. True, yes. Uh, bottom, uh, bottom left. Quite few. And uh, bottom right. Top left. Uh, we get equally, equally right amount. So I thought we'll get somewhere more than another one. Uh, four years ago, if I'll show this picture, uh, to my audience, and I was giving this presentation here four years ago. No one guessed which fo fo uh, picture was created. Let's see the answers. We compared the artwork that has been generated in 2002 with fractal mathematics generated by skis, with some watercolors generated by Raktopoulos and mandrel by Frank Max. We are in 2024, and we still cannot say if it was generated by AI or not. 22 years ago, off you go. So it's not the new topic, and we were doing the great things about this before. How did we do this? Because it's not, we haven't, it was not something called generative AI, which everyone talks about this 22 years ago. We were using AI algorithms. Some of them is called evolutionary algorithm. How we did it? We didn't get the pictures immediately. Can you see what we were going through? We were getting evolutionary problem definition. We were getting, can you see how messy it was our main pictures? Have you seen it? You will never appreciate this if I'll show you now. We get some background definitions and what's coming in and at the end we were getting some artist appreciation which I was expecting most of you will say, yes, it's this one. We didn't get. Whenever I say the word AI now, it's almost like a sexy word. So basically, yes, I want to use it and do this. If somebody will tell somewhere that I'm using AI 22 years ago, especially in the products we are using, it almost was guaranteed you will be out of business because of uh, public was not accepting these technologies and we were not, not looking how it comes. When we generated these pictures and you see some of them, what I did, I had some my uh, critic, art critic person who basically I said, listen, I have my uh, friend, he's doing artist, art's work, so he painted four pictures and he's looking for some uh, references to find out what's going on. So could you please tell me uh, and give feedback about his artwork. What do you think? He did. In 2002, 
pictures have been, oops, pictures have been compared by, with Van Gogh. He was even given the names, not me. He was given the names. Ice skating, forest, frosted glass. This was real his world about this. He has done all these reviews and he gave me the pictures. And it would not be fair on him to don't say that it was actually AI yeah, did it. And I told him, um, actually, it was artificial intelligence created with pictures. Uh, what do you think reaction was? He was excited, love it. He hasn't spoke to me for three weeks. <laughs> True story. And I needed to buy the box of chocolate and come say, listen, let's start to talk again. <laughs> I promise I'll not take you more. This is how much our, uh, our populations, we did not accept AI that can do something tangible and usable. Oh well, evolutionary algorithm, we go through Darwin. Has anyone knows what is this small creatures are? Ants. When we go to forest, we sometimes see some ant colonies. We can see some ants building some paths. They're going somewhere through the borders and anywhere. So especially when we're a child, I remember I would be always looking on all these uh, ants moving and thinking how on the way they would find the food and will find the way back. Remember, artificial intelligence is about inspiring from nature. Yeah? Anything that we can get inspired and in how it goes. So, some people got inspired by nature and especially by ants and how they walk. So what the ants do, they basically try to find food and from food they go to the nest and from nest to food. But there are some ants which we like to explore, so basically they look and don't bother about anyone else. We want to see what's going on uh, next. And there are some workers which carry food. Poor guys. And when you start to look at them, at some point in ant colonies, the paths will always become shorter and shorter. The ants will not take so long to take any more from food to nest and again. Interesting. Uh, have you ever thought I'll be giving you some uh, lesson on biology? Uh, I know that it lectures about artificial, artificial intelligence, but what scientists did, they got inspired by ant colonies. They started to say, if ants can find, can we build something that there are some algorithms which will find ways from food to nest and back? Well, we are not exceptions. We follow other uh, scientists, and this is how we started to work on supply chain optimization on Caterpillar. This is what uh, Professor Jeff Rogers mentioned about. We were working on this for 10 years. And we landed with this job by accident. Uh, remember my love to evolutionary algorithms? I didn't want to give up this. And one day I was um, invited to participate in competition uh, by Caterpillar for demand forecast prediction. And we say demand forecast prediction in supply chain. Never touched supply chain before. I, don't, I didn't know what it is. And I told him, do you realize you invite me for competition and I will lose it? And they say, fine, you don't want, you don't want, but if we invite you, try it. And we did. So it was some scientists from Australia, China, US, Africa. We were covering all continents and we were getting invitations. So uh, competition was one year long, okay? So, and we decided in halfway through to find out who is doing how on these results. Six months in competition, we submit our program code, we test, any guess what place we got? First, wrong, last. <laughs> we got last, <laughs> and I come back and say, I told you we are last. What do you expect? We are not going to get. But what it told me about this, I was trying to mimic everybody's research before. I was not trying to create my own. I was not trying to do something on my way. 
because I was not specialist in my area. So I thought, oh, I better follow somebody else rather than do something else. So after six months, we scrap everything out and we start again based on what I knew but best. And we started to use evolutionary algorithms. Okay? Twelve months later on, we get another competition. My students were running with me all this program code, and uh, I was saying, do you want to go to US? And they said, listen, we were last last time. There were no chances we get anywhere else. We didn't go. Fair enough, because who wants to be losers? But I needed to go. Uh, we were in the room with uh, all top managers of Caterpillar, because this was quite high-level competition. And uh, you got some operation managers, uh, uh, techn technology uh, directors, general directors, supply chain optimizations, and so on. And uh, we have some speakers, like from China, where we're presenting a lot of maths. When I look at them, and I was thinking, oh my god. It's like, I have no chance, but I have nothing to lose. And I was coming and presenting theory of Darwin. What do you think reaction was? They smile. They smile, well, they look at me and say, well, fair enough, but he's a good guy. And after presentations, we make an uh, announcement on results, and it was four categories. First category coming out, who was the first? Us. Second category coming out, who was the first? Us. And I can see the face of all these managers are changing quietly. Third category, and remember, this was in um, 2003. No one except show this. Third category coming out. What our place are? First, well, you know where we're going. <laughs> uh, at this point, everyone was sitting quietly and didn't dare to look at me. And I was like sort of speechless. I didn't believe myself. Fourth category coming out. What got place? No, we got second. <laughs> so we got second, but we got the tide because the weighting of three categories was exactly the same as uh, the last one. Okay, and this is where I learned we were in Europe. The second team, which was just run up for us, they were in US. And we submitted our program code. 52 minutes late. We got the second because of 52 minutes. I got the lesson, never ever submit the last minutes. Whenever we have read something, even if I think it doesn't work, we submit, getting around. But this is how our journey started about optimization of supply chain and Caterpillar. This is how we started to work on algorithms and started to get how it's happening. Our first work, which we have done, and we are trying to work on the work on uh, supply chain optimization, it was basically taking Caterpillar three months to run on high-performance computers just to get some results on 200 products. When I had some questions, do you think where is any IP in this? I said, listen, if it takes three months to run these results, will anyone ever use it? No, it's a good game, but nothing else. Just for you to understand the sizes of problems we are trying to solve, on real problems, we are looking for 14,000 distribution network models. We are looking for 100 plus network product lines, variables to update, 100, and how many zeros? Quite a bit, trillions, okay? So this is the complexity of networks we are coming up. Question to audience, do you think about, do you remember Brexit? Do you know what it is? Good. So when Brexit happened, Caterpillar had our models. So it was nine, nine years later on to run on their 7,000 new products, 120,000 parts. How long do you think it was taking them on normal computer? Wild guess? Six months? Anything else? 52 minutes. It's true. So it was taking them 52 minutes to run optimization on fault. This is how much we optimize the algorithms. 
This is how much quicker we, can ma we made them, okay? So it's not about only algorithm, understanding how to make them smarter, better performing, well performing and faster, okay? In 24 hours, the model for strategic reconfiguration of supply chain has been created in Caterpillar and full global supply chain has been reconfigured after announcement of Brexit. No one knew it was AI, but because of this model, the core engine was helping them to get there so far. Oh, well, so we get a bit of awards around this. So basically, I, uh, I was very upset having second place. So basically, after this, I was making sure that we'll get several awards when we're getting around. At least I would get some trophy. Um, this is how we work with companies, but sometimes, like remember, the nature gives us inspirations. Have you heard about athletes? Apparently, aunt, uh, aunts, we are, we are living as a colonies, but they have their own small pets, and these pets are called aphids. They nurture them, they look after them, they provide food. We got inspired by them. But also, we knew the problems that, when, for example, like we want to optimize our networks. We want to reconfigure networks super fast without losing the knowledge which we have. We started to introduce aphids in our genetic algorithms. And as a result, we're having the fastest performing algorithms on dynamic optimization. Whenever event comes, we can reconfigure very fast with very little computational resources. Remember, I was not very fancy to come back to all these monitors in the labs at some point. So uh, I said, we need to be smarter. If we speak about ant colonies, it means there are a lot of different algorithms around. And it could be bees algorithms, it could be bad colonies algorithms, and so on. There are many of them. And a lot of scientists were using it, not only for a couple of years, but quite for a bit. We're not speaking only about the nature, but we speak about some process of biology, how it comes and how it generates and so on. But there is one the most secretive organ in our body, brain. No one knows how it operates up to now. We can only guess about this. And this imitation of the brain, this is what we speak about neural networks, about the convolution neural networks, about deep learning, about generative AI, anything that you had about very fancy words. They try to imitate the way how brain works. And this is how like sort of most of our algorithms work now on our computers. So what can we do with all these neural networks and trying to figure out what can do? So remember that I'm a scientist, I need to have a problem. If I have a problem, I will try to figure out what would happen. Uh, do you remember uh, Reykjavik uh, eruption, all planes, everything has been landed in Europe. We cannot get in, we cannot get out. So basically we were completely blocked because of the ashes of volcano coming in. So we spot about this and we started to work with National Aviation Agency and try to figure out what we can do about this. And we realize that we can have a data from 52 GPS stations, it's across the globe, try to understand if we can detect some presence of ashes in the air. But this is not enough because we need to get meteorological data on the top, the wind, the conditions, and anything coming up. We develop some artificial intelligence system using neural networks the way how our brain works, remember? And at the time, this was the largest study to complete. And it was providing 95% of accuracy. When we presented this work to National Aviation Agency, they had a look at this, and it was top management, managers of there, and um, I say, it's great. Now we need to implement this. But because of it was high security, we never heard about this later on. But as far as I know, some boxes, boxes have been implemented and have been looked. So what we learned from here, 
neural networks, artificial intelligence, as anyone else, need to have a data from different sources. So we were looking of a data from GPS, we were looking meteorological data, how to get them together, how to make it work. As a result, we were getting quite high accuracy coming around. If these type of smart boxes we were installed in planes, we would know where the planes can fly and where they cannot. But not at the time. Um, I like to bring some um, help to the people and try to find out if there are any other way how to use AI. One thing, like maybe you learned by now, we don't have a lot of resources, but we want to be creative. One of my students was trying to have a look and work on the project where we were trying to detect a limbs, movements of the limbs on the screen. The work was done in 2008, but, uh, I said, we don't have any senses. He said, yeah, but there are a lot of senses. Can we do it? I said, no, we want to make sure that we detect using mobile phone. We don't want to get any senses, any extra devices. And at the time, we managed to implement the system using neural networks where we will be detecting what parts of limbs has been moving, what has been amputated. We didn't know what was amputated and locations without any senses, without any information, except simple phone. And I can tell you, he was arguing with me quite for a while, having senses, but at the, at the end, he was proud of it. So what we learn from here, we don't always need to use all resources what we have. Sometimes we need to think how people will use it and how it will be convenient for people. If I would say about senses, most likely elderly people will not be able to use it because any extra sensor is very difficult to use. But having mobile phone make it easy. Oh well. Uh, maybe you notice that I don't really like to stay all the time only on supply chain or boring stuff, so we basically explore a bit of different ways. Uh, at some point we landed in competition on Afex in the US. We were applying for competition to see if we can basically generate the uh, solutions where looking on the chipboard, we can identify what elements we have on chipboard, what if anyone has tempered in, and what the problem are. Uh, competition was at this scale. It was 125 companies applied. They preselected eight for final. And we were lucky one to be in final. We were the only university in the preselected team. We were the only university outside of US. Everyone else was in US during competition. And obvious, obviously, we were trying to run it on a real-time basis. So basically, how can we just looking on this board to say what is hidden? But our students are brilliant. They, are, they can have some creativity and try to unlock something which is not standard. We were basically bought 3D printer, disassemble this, built some cameras around, and started to bring, create exceptionally high resolution of images. Something that's like at micro, microscopic level to take. So it's caused us to build just under 1,000 pounds to get the maximum possible information out of here. When we were in competition, uh, I'll come back to this later. When we were in competition, can you see the names of the companies? Does, can, can someone look? I hope that no one is from KPMG here. Uh, or Barté. So basically, we had very top companies worldwide which were competing against us. Uh, one of the team, which was team up on KPMG and Barté, they had equipment worth of half million pounds, only equipment. We were standing next to them, we had one and a half thousand pounds equipment. Uh, when we ran real-time competition, we were trying to find out, we also saw about 25 people working for, uh, for these guys, try to find out solution, and we had only six people in my team. 
and uh, I, was, I, I had constantly judges coming in, where is the rest of your guys? Who is doing the job? I say, this is my guys. We don't believe you, you're not telling the truth. Um, the result, we won. What we learn from there, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you don't have creativity, if you don't know how to efficiently use your resources, and how to make automation and AI used in the most clever way, it will never be useful for you. And I hope, I want to believe that some of my guys and myself will learn just a little bit how to use artificial intelligence in our needs. Um, as a result, this competition lead us to some ideas. Have you noticed, nowadays it's all about data. So uh, remember my example about Volcano, so basically we had massive amount of GPS stations, we had um, all meteorological data just to get accuracy 95, but unfortunately we don't have so much of computational resources to run in our, uh, for our lab, and we started to think, can we understand the data? Do we really need to have so much of data to get this accuracy up? And what we are trying to do, we were trying to start to have a look on all these PCBs, start to locate them from different points and take different pictures to find out if we will create systematic data set and find out is there any data we don't need to take. What is interesting, we found out that there are such data that we don't need to take them and they would not bring any value in. What we need, we also need only this center and the end, that's it. Any other data you collect, it will not make any value to any algorithm working up. What it means, it means we don't need to use large data set. We can reduce data set and we can get the new state of art. Actually, this is what we did it. We reduced data and we are number one in number of data sets now, but not using uh, computational power. What we did, we start to reduce uh, carbon emission, CO2. So we are not speaking now anymore about AI as a creative one. We are speaking about being environmentally friendly, which is good. We love our environment and want to look after this. Uh, this is a bit of boring stuff, but uh, out of this boring stuff, what we got, like, uh, uh, these engines has been monitored, high power engine, engines has been monitored and trying to find out if there is something wrong with these engines and how they work. So we have a company called World Vision who is basically collecting uh, uh, information about power lines the currents, voltage, and how it works. Apparently, if we will have a look very closely to this current and voltage, we can spot if there are any problems because machinery is very large. Imagine like in mines, machinery which it works, it's about half million pounds, one million pounds. Will anyone allow you to approach this machinery? Don't even think about this. So we need to find clever ways how we can monitor to find out what's going on. Okay, so what we did, we would not be allowed to open up all these machines as well. We build all these test tricks. We experimented in our labs here from scratch to find out what can be behave and how it could be getting. We also find some online data sets and we're trying to find out what anomalies is. What isn't interesting, we found open source data set which was two billion data points. We reduce this to 200,000, yeah? And we get better results. From two billion data points to 200,000, and we are getting better results. We get it because we try to find out where the data are useful, where are not. So basically, we reduce the data, and we get better results. And this is what we are starting to look. We are not looking on artificial intelligence as one thing. 
we're trying to see what else can we do in such a way that will bring our planet green and what could be happening. And by the way, some of the guys were, guys, hands up, they did this work. So if you don't believe me, talk to them. <laughs> um, agriculture. I haven't told you about agriculture so far, did I? Uh, we were doing basically working with uh, a small com uh, company, a small robot company, which is sadly has been dissolved a couple of days ago. We were developing the robots and we were looking on conditions monitoring of soil. We were working on uh, designing of, of a small devices. Can you see these small devices? That allows us not only to get conditions of the soil, but also predict if there are some any, any way how we can implement this. So can you see how many different applications in the eye can we draw? And it's all completely different. And I can tell you that every single time we were using very much different algorithm. It was not the paste and copy. It would not work. Diabetes. We have the vast majority of people who, which are affected inside of our planet with diabetes. We have some problems, which is basically is that even if you have monitor of diabetes set up, you still need to know what you eat and how you move to ensure that you don't have this jump. We are working with uh, a company called uh, Blue Roof Labs, and we were developing some AI assistance, which, and actually robot, which will be moving after the elderly people in the rooms. They will have a bottle of water. Apparently, if you get some water, you could get picked down and some medication, as well as trying to calculate what can you eat, what you don't, based on what we are getting reading from the census. All this would not be possible if we are not using AI systems inside and how to help people. Uh, can you see that before I was showing you everything about data? But now, I'm having small robots coming in. Robots are fun as well, so it's not only about the data in any way. So we can develop them if necessary, but they need to bring some good for us. Robot hand. We started to develop this whole robot hand about 2010, and we are still the unique one in a way, the only one in the world. Can you guess what is it? Any ideas? This robot hand holds an egg. What hand is it? Left. And this one holds the gut. What hand is it? Right. We have one robot which can perform as left hand or right hand without changing any configuration. And we were using AI to control this robot. We were using AI to do all this wiring and anything. So basically, you, by now you may be understood that I'm very lazy and I'm letting AI to do a lot of stuff. So basically, a lot of stuff of this has been designed by AI. And we implemented this. We didn't get as far as getting the robots to design this. Well, what is next? Any ideas? I had a bit of career in artificial intelligence. Do you think I've done everything that's possible? You don't believe me? Oh, well. AI is now popular and it's coming up. Do we know anything about the data? What do we need to use? What do we need to keep? What do we need to get rid of? And which data will bring us value? How can we define them? Can we use minimal carbon emission for AI. More and more, we are asking more computational powers, how can we do this? Can we understand the solution? Remember, no one trusts the AI, it works, it's fine, but when you try to get more critical solutions, you want to know why we get this solution. We need to get some explanation, it's not easy to get some. Can we trust them to make decisions? Currently, New EU AI Act has been released uh, last year, and I have been told yesterday it has been 
announced British AI Act. We started to speak about regulations of AI. How can we design the system that will be law compliant? We will not make any harm and will not get, be biased. Chat GPT, I was asking you, have you used this? Yes, you used it, it was good, yeah? But it's great when you ask general questions. If I will ask you questions in medicine, do you think it's reliable, it's safe to get answers? No. How can we use chat GPT in professional environments? How we can modify the models, change architectures, that we can safely use it in finance, construction, healthcare, and anywhere else, where it would not hallucinate, it will not invent, but it will give you answers based on the facts. Oh well, this is what will be another story in, I don't know if I'll be invited ever again. <laughs> and many more to come. Now, just a little bit more. Uh, have you seen what we have been doing so far? We didn't get so much resources, but we always managed to find a way how to get and achieve great solutions. What we found, if we will get some restrictions on the way how we design and what we do, sometimes our creativity, it brings us far better answers and coming in. And uh, we should not be afraid of ins be inspired, believe in yourself, and see how it comes. Crazy ideas sometimes work. Believe it or not, it does. And don't be afraid to create these crazy ideas and see how it goes. Make it simple. All great inventions are simple. We found out that when we simplify algorithms, when we simplify understanding what the core is, systems become simpler, we understand what it goes. But revenue is better. Make it work. Make it work well. Make it work fast. This is the mantra which all of us now, my team, following, and it's coming from one greatest, great scientist, Tony Grichnik, who is from US, and uh, it does absolutely magic. As long as we learn this mantra, guys are following, and we just basically do the great things and stuff around this. Make it visually understandable. If we don't understand, we don't believe, and we don't use it, and this is important to start. And once it's working and you are happy, make it complex again. And the cycle starts. Well, we get so far. Did you enjoy? Um, it was all about me. Wait. Do you really think I was the only one to get here to this level of chief? No. But there are a lot of people behind, which I would like to say special thank you and say how proud I am to get involved with them. My team, hands up. Thank you. <laughs> they are making amazing work. They are always making some extra mile to get something when it comes. My colleagues, hands up. Some of them, <laughs> afraid. My friends, I saw some of you. Hands up. <laughs> ah, we're getting there. We get support and anywhere, whichever it comes, it will be important. And we'd like to say thank you for them. I would like to say special thank you for my parents, for being there, believing in me. From whichever I was small, my mom was telling me, you will be professor. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I got professor when she is no longer with us. But I can proudly say I get it, and she was right. I don't know how she predicted this, and uh, I'm sure that she was not using artificial intelligence. <laughs> and the last, my rock and solid, which I'm proud of, my family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy a little bit. When you will be leaving, we have a little bit surprise for you until we get que questions and answers. 
Um, we have some demos for you. Our team got worked very hard to show you some things what we have done with artificial intelligence. Also, we have some postcards. You know, I don't like to let you go without remembering what I have done. <laughs> you thought you will run away without anything? <laughs> oh no. We printed out some postcards with work that has been done by AI in 2002. I know postcard is not very fashionable now, and you could do whatever it is, but I know if you will take one in very rainy evening in UK, you will remember about this lecture. Thank you very much for audience for coming. So I want to extend my thanks to Tatiana as well. I mean, it always shocks me and surprises me uh, about the creativity that, that Tatiana brings to all the projects. I mean, she isn't just focused on one, which sometimes a lot of us are, and we just work on one particular project. I think whenever I'm sitting with her, I get blown away with the, with the magnitude and the creativity. And as we all saw today, you know, the energy and the enthusiasm is very, very infectious. And, and you know, I also want to be a part of the team as well. I think it's, it's a beautiful journey that, that, that she has gone on. And she's highlighted to us as well of how, I think in particular for me, it's a collaborative nature that, that she brings to uh, her research. Uh, and that actually inspires her team, as you saw, her work as well. So I think... That is amazing. So I'd like to give her a, an even stronger thanks for that. So I think also, I mean, you know, AI is always a very, very interesting topic because it has many, many manifold or many, many different ways of dripping into our life somehow and dripping into applications somehow as well. So I think we're going to have now sort of maybe 15 or 20 minutes of uh, Q&A, uh, as they say. So we'll get the house lights off on. And, and we have <laughs> microphones, roaming microphones. So uh, who's going to kick start the, uh, the question? Oh, dear. Now I see everyone. <laughs> I can point now. Uh, so who's going to? I mean, there's a lot about creativity. And in fact, we've got our very first speaker. Uh, the, uh, question. Uh, does anyone have a mic? There's one. Well, in fact, stay with that mic there. I'll give you my own special mic, yeah? Uh, it's very exotic, but I'll give it to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pleasure. Abraham. Thank you. Um, congratulations on a really interesting lecture. I think you did a lot to dispel uh, the anxieties that many people have around AI. And also what you showed brilliantly was, yes, your creativity, but also agility and resourcefulness. So doing a lot, often with very scarce resource. So that was excellent. Um, I suppose there's sort of two bits that I'm really interested in. One is about these real world problems and challenges and whether as a researcher in terms of your journey, you've anticipated those problems or whether they've kind of come to you at fortuitous times. And the other question is about the kind of what next and what you think will be the important priority areas where you can apply your expertise around AI? So, so two very simple questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, I think uh, we started to use AI. Do we trust AI? No. How to make sure that whatever AI design, it's get with trust and knowledge of what we know. How can we understand what solutions are and how can we trust. I'll give you an example because quite a lot of AI I have done in the environment where nobody believed it. Remember the reaction of top management uh, company when they were looking at me and saying evolutionary algorithms, selection, mutation, crossover, it's not going to work and we did. What we didn't manage to do at the time and we still don't know full answers, why AI was generating these solutions. So what we were doing, it was a little bit like sort of retrospective. 
you will generate solution, and now then trying to find out why it did it. And very often we'll find out that it basically was trying to find out all parts, all products that basically live from one manufacturer without knowing this. So very often AI gives solution, which is good, but we haven't learned yet understand why it was given this solution. And I think it's one thing to go. For the last couple of years, I work quite a lot in uh, environmental AI. There is only one reason. Have you noticed my competitive nature? I like trophies. Uh, recently, there are very large databases has been uh, released for AI uh, scientists to experiment. What we did, we did experiment and have a look. When we look on uh, databases, which models were winning? And the models which were winning, the ones which were getting 10, 20, 30 times more data get in. What does it mean for artificial intelligence? It means you need to get a lot of computational resources to get there. So we were immediately out of competition. We also were curious to find out these top six people, who are they? Can you get wild guess where these people coming from on the first six performing models? Facebook, Google, Twitter. It was all commercial companies which have massive amount of resources. I was immediately outside of competition. I would not get my glory up, okay? So that's why we started to see and think about what is useful data. How can we use this useful data? How can we minimize the data, remove data from data sets, and get the new state of art? We managed to do it now. We managed to demonstrate sometimes in data sets when we remove the data, performance is better. But you should not be doing this randomly, you shouldn't understand. So the next one, make AI more trustable, more believing in law compliance, because as soon as AI act become a law, a lot of all this great stuff I showed you, it's become unlawful. How can we make it that it's become lawful? Uh, lawful? How we can, if the law changes, how can we make sure that we're always compliant? Apparently, we've done analysis about how often the laws are changing. In the last 30 years, we did analysis how often the law changed. In uh, 80s, 90s, the law was changing about one, two, three, every one, two, three years, so something like this. And now it started to escalate to the level that it was changing and it was introducing new acts and modifications every couple of six months. So imagine you design the system which you work on the system for five years, you deploy the system as a business and in six months it's become not usable because law change. How can we make sure that AI will comply with law and automatically change? Mm. And I don't think anyone knows the answer for this. No. Thank you. Um, fantastic talk. Um, so I just have a question. So you were talking about what next, right? So the last point was how can we use large language models like ChatGPT in professional environments? Yep. So um, I come from AI, so I'll ask a slightly technical question. Um, do you think, in your opinion, <laughs> It's professional, you know, it's large language models that should be optimized for professional environment work or should it be specialized models, uh, you know, using sort of multi-agent systems? Uh, it depends from what uh, site you will start. I had very interesting conversation with one of the Google uh, employees who were working on medical site and his opinion is we need to start to create the networks for professional environments where we can start to see. In my opinion, we started to work on this uh, large language models just the last couple of months. Ask me this question in three years, I'll give you answers. <laughs> but uh, what is happening, I believe that it's not only about the models, it's about information and knowledge you give to the models. And how do you make sure that once you give this model, if there is no answer, model says, I don't know. At the moment, chat GPT doesn't know what it gives you, it's invent. So creativity is good, but 
how can we make sure that there is no risk creativity in professional environment? We just started to work on this uh, type of project literally from 1st of February, and I hope that in a couple of uh, years I'll give you more specific answers. Yeah, that's wonderful. So, so I hope everyone else is thinking about different questions while the next question. Yeah, thank you for the excellent talk, Tatiana. So many projects and all solved with ML, so it seems like it's the magic wand which fixes anything. So the question is, have, have you encountered any areas, uh, specific problems where maybe more classical statistical methods still outperform uh, machine learning approaches? And do you see it changing? If you have a small problems, normally classical mathematical models outperform because you have various restrictions in such environment and such parameters are limited. As long as you start to increase number of unknowns and you see that we started simple and when we start to work on the problem, normally <coughs> AI is losing against mathematical models. But as long as you start to introduce uncertainty, new parameters, you start to see that these restrictions doesn't work anymore and AI starts to work more. So it's sort of like balance between uh, mm. number of parameters and the size of search space. AI is good for the large space search where mathematical models cannot compete. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. Who's got the next one? Go ahead. I have got a multitude of questions for you because you've been very <laughs> stimulating. But can I, I just give you two? Yes. We've all recently been shocked by a malfunction with the post office and the computer system and the, the pain that it's caused those sub, uh, postmasters. So how do we detect if there's a malfunction in AI? Mm. This is a good question. <laughs> Uh, at the moment, we were working only trying to detect if someone has malfunction. Remember the picture with drone? In the drone, what we were trying to design, when we were preparing for competition with Athlex, we were trying to see if someone will try to intervene with drone. Can we capture this and we continue to perform as it should be? So basically, we designed AI system that will prevent us from getting redirected. So this is what we speak about AI Act, new law. When you design AI system, you should not be only thinking about solution. You should always thinking about the false fraud detection inside of models created away. And how can you protect this? And we will show you examples of uh, drone once you get out. And may I give you the second one, which um, being clinically orientated, I'm very interested in the prosthetic arms and things. But we do have a brain and we have emotions and we have intents and things. How do we get that prosthetic AI arm to respond to a human brain? Uh, uh, it was a lot of, I am very afraid to touch the human brain by myself. <laughs> and I'll be very much reluctant to get someone who will touch the brain and control <laughs> this. No matter how much I like AI, um, I'm not 100% confident about this, but this is me. There are a lot of research that has been done in the area where they put chip inside, they read the signals, and they can, can connect these signals either for missing spine the nerves or passing the signals to, the, for example, robot head that could be controlled. But I don't trust myself to pick this chip in human. I think we are, as a human, perfect enough to recover this, mm -hmm. and you need to know far more than what mm -hmm. I know to be adventurous to get. So yeah. I may be adventurous, but not enough <laughs> to do this. Yeah, no, I mean, this question about trust is, is very, very critical, and I think Tatiana mentioned it a number of times. Justin, if you could. Uh, Thanks very much. So, in your lecture, you highlighted a number of brilliant examples where AI has been used very effectively uh, and uh, ha has done great good. So, I wonder if you could uh, reflect on why, when companies use AI for customer service, it's uniformly awful. <laughs> <laughs> 
one of the question is, because we are using large, large language models and we've done a bit of research over last year and what we found out, large language model, they work really well if you have a structured dialogue. What does mean structured dialogue? Question one, I know the answer. Question two, I know the answers. If you will ask another question, they don't know what to do. So we, that's why this is one of the reasons, and I get annoyed with all these chatbots, no, you're not the only one. This is one of the reasons we started to work on this area, and now we focus on something called unstructured dialogue, so that robots not only give answer, they try to understand what you said, and it just answer through it. And because current of LLM models, they are really well developed for the guidance or understanding of text, but not for our conversation like this. They are not used for purpose. They haven't built for the purpose of conversation we want to use. And I do believe we work with very large companies like Telefonica, Union. So basically, hopefully, in uh, two or three years' time, we will start to deploy some of uh, our models, and now uh, we have some colleagues of mine working with me on this area. Yeah. So, so there's another you know, crucial word, understanding. I mean, what do they understand? And trust as well, which is another critical thing. I think Tatiana's working on both aspects. I think we've got another one just at the top. Hello? Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I recently att attended a colloquium. A chap was uh, singing the praises of uh, wind farms and solar panels. Uh, and quite a good case for both of those. Until I asked him, well, how is that going to interface with the national grid? And especially, how is it going to interface with the presumably uh, systems which convert the spare electricity to, say, hydrogen and oxygen? And uh, he said, oh, yeah, that's, that's going to be a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. But it strikes me that your distribution models uh, might well be useful in that case. Could be. Um, right, good. Well, I, I hope you start that as a research project because I think we'll need it shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just need to have a company who are willing to work with us and we'll start on. Yeah. Yes. So I think Thank we've you. got another, another question. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I want to know how you would respond to concerns that AI is going to obliterate all the jobs and, you know, cause unemployment to increase. It's a very good question. I've been asked this question several times. Yes. Beginning of 19th yes. century, technical revolution. Do you remember yes. what was happening? It was a lot of fears that the robots will be overtaking the new jobs. It was a lot of fear that a lot of people will lose their jobs. What's happened in reality? It's they get more jobs than they lost it. Some of the jobs have been uh, disappeared, but the new jobs needed to get. And description of these jobs, we didn't know at the time because we were fearing this. We are, some of people, calling the current era is AI revolution. Do you see similarities with technical revolution? We have a lot of fears we are going to lose the jobs, but we don't have a new descriptors of the jobs which will be coming up. And until we don't know, we are uncertain what is going to happen. But once we know, we will enjoy using ChatGPT to, for marketing purposes because uh, they will be saving for some time of jobs, which I don't like to do, but it gives you some new type of descriptions which we haven't thought about. And I do believe in this, that while we are thinking about the current description of the jobs, yes, they will go on. But have you ever had that AI will give jobs? New descriptions? All these AI systems, they need to be maintained. Amount of data coming in, who is going to look at them? We are not going to work intensively. AI laws are changing. How can we find out that AI laws? So when you see a lot of new questions coming up and we don't have job descriptions, we don't know how we call, we are going to call these people. And I think this is the future for young people. 
they would not be able to survive without AI. But just only the question is how they are going to use it and how the new job descriptions will come. So we are not going to lose the jobs. We'll get new jobs, but we don't know which one. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think there was another question. Well, of course you can. Go ahead. I ask a quick and simple question, I think. Oh, those um, are the dangerous ones here. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever that pr one, proviso comes up. One of the features of artificial intelligence, as I understand, is, is to, based on historical data, to improve and refine the predictability and precision of the future. So in doing that, is there a danger that uh, it will outshine us and become smarter than us and know more about us than we know ourselves? Uh, I think it's always a dangerous thing. I don't really want, I give you only what I want you to give. Do you re really believe me? I always get success story from the first round. I don't show you my failures. And uh, what I am giving, like in public information, yes, none except my guys, my team, knows how much of runs and trials in any way will go through because we get success. I show you success stories. If I fail, I'm not going to tell you about <laughs> until I get the answer. And in this case, when the AI works, it doesn't mean that always all information will be accepted, accessible about me. If you try to predict my behavior, but you don't have all information, but you just know this one, you might not predict correctly. Not because you are good in prediction, because you don't have enough information. Mm. And that's where we start to say about what data we need to predict. Do we have enough data, what resources we need? And get into these areas of higher predictivity, uh, percentage of predictions, but making sure that we predict correctly, we need to really understand a little bit. And now that's why before we told you about these stories, we are trying to understand what we really need, what signals we need to use to predict. So I would say systems can be as good as people created them. And uh, if uh, you don't have sufficient data or you haven't touched anything else, very unlikely you'll predict this. So that's why there are a lot of work to be carrying on in future, making sure that the system predicted will be predicted in the future because there is something called data shift. Data are changing, environment changing. How many of systems predicted COVID? <coughs> but they didn't predict it because we just had historical data, nothing else. We haven't took any of uh, element of... Uh, That's right, nothing. absolutely. So uh, we've got time for about a couple more questions, I think. So. Anyone else? Yes, of course. I knew you wanted to ask questions. So, shall I throw it to you? No, you must feel sorry for the ones. <laughs> in. That's good. And you uh, caught thank it. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I think we're all used to sort of tropes about AI taking over humanity, which probably aren't true. But um, what do you think are the imminent dangers, if any, that, that we need to be aware of when it comes to new technologies like AI? Um, I think. At we are currently in the situation we need to be very careful the way how we use AI because there is very little of regulations of AI at the moment. There are a lot of biases that has not been capturing. And until we understood how to build the safe AIs for safe environment to use for the kids, for vulnerable people, we will always get some answers. We need to be very careful and double checking. Never believe what AI say and always double check. No matter how brilliant, I've done all results. And I think that is absolutely wonderful way to, to end the, uh, the lecture. Even though we had, I said two, didn't I? Two questions. So <laughs> I, I apologize. So we're not going to end it, Tatiana. Last question then. Where Hi, um, first of all, thank you for um, speaking to us. I found this lecture really good. Um, as for the dangers of AI, um, do you think that in the future AI could potentially lead humans in a sort of political manner and potentially do the jobs of polit politicians? You will never know if it has been done already. 
so <laughs> that's the premise. Did you know how many of you knew that you were using AI in the 90s? Have you seen how many hands were up? Until I said the word Google. So you would not know how much of AI has been used already for political games. I will give you an example. We had like my, I had work with students on one of the projects, like AI, obviously. And he was telling me, Tatiana, do you realize I will never ever use this in my career? It's good fun, but it's good toy. Six months later, he got the job. He worked in the company Intel. Have you heard about this? He calls me and says, Tatiana, you don't believe what I'm doing, what I'm doing. I do exactly what I've been doing in my final year project. AI has been used by companies for very long time. And this conversation has happened 15 years ago. Did we know about this? No. How many of, some of you had a class in 80s? Did you know that in 80s, in order to control injection of petrol in your car, it was used a neural network to minimize, and it was artificial intelligence. If at the time one manufacturer will leak information, AI controls your engine, would you buy this car? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you will be the only one who will buy it. Acceptance of technology came only the last couple of years. And I was always outliers. And actually, I was always, whenever presentation comes, the favorites always come in from mathematical models. But whenever we will compare mathematical models with AI, by some reasons, AI was winning. But now we just need to learn. It's become public. Who loves Google? Who, search, who Googles? Who searches with? Everyone. It's normal. But it has been from day number one, it was used with AI. It just for the first eight years, they will never ever mention this. And it's exactly the same. We don't know how much of AI has been used by now. And you may never know. You could just guess. So that brings the evening to, to an end. I think let's thank Tatiana again for that wonderful tour de force. Thank you very much. And there's only one thing left. We've got drinks in the, uh, just outside here, with some light nibbles, I think, you can have with them. And remember, next week, week after next, uh, we've got another uh, public lecture, uh, not public, uh, inaugural lecture. So please do come, yeah? Another journey is going to take place. Thank you very much. And uh, remember, oh, thank you. And remember, <laughs> we do have some demos to show how AI works and what we do. And if you really want to remember something, postcards are there with artwork generated Wonderful. by Thank AI. You. Thank you. Thank you.